Welcome. And thank you so much for being here on this very, very exciting day for us. As you heard, I'm Maria Ristigueta, and I'm the director of the School of Public Policy and Administration. I have the honor to formally welcome you to the first ever event of the Biden School. Our school has always had a vital mission to equip students with the knowledge, experience, and skills they need to go out and make a difference in their communities and the world. Today, we're thrilled to put a name, a face, and a legacy to that mission. We are proud to become the Joseph R. Biden, Jr. School of Public Policy and Administration. Our students, our faculty, and our staff could not be more excited about the opportunities that this change will create. And I know that more than 5,000 alumni serving Delaware, some that are right here in the audience, and they're serving the state, the nation, and the world are as excited as well. The Biden name means something to Americans of all ages and backgrounds. But for us, the name has special meaning. It's shorthand for our values, public service, civic engagement, thoughtfulness, inclusivity, and respect. And of course, it's a daily reminder of what this institution can do for the students it serves. Because we know that the University of Delaware did for Joe Biden. It inspired and transformed him. The work we'll be engaged in inside and outside of the classroom will carry the legacy forward. And I thank you all for joining us on the first step of that journey. Now it takes a precedent to introduce the vice president. <laughs> it's my pleasure to turn things over to the wonderful president of the University of Delaware, Dr. Dennis Asanas. Thank you, Maria. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Eleni and I are so thrilled that so many of you have joined us uh, today here at the University of Delaware to celebrate a momentous occasion. The naming of our School of Public Policy and Administration after Joe Biden. From now on, we will fondly call it the Biden School. Let's give a round of applause to all the faculty and the students and fellows and everybody else, the administrators who have worked tirelessly for many, many years to build the, the legacy of the school so that it can be worthy of uh, Vice President Biden's name. Let's give everybody a hand. <laughs> and thank you, Maria, for your leadership of the Biden School. And thank you also to Valerie Biden-Owens, Kathy McLaughlin, and Mike Dolany for the leadership of uh, the Biden Institute, which is an integral part of our Biden School. <laughs> and what a better way to celebrate this uh, landmark day than having a conversation in which all of you will participate between uh, Vice President Biden and John Mitchin. You all know our chairman of the Biden School, and I'll say a few more words in a minute. And of course, uh, all of you know as well John Mitchum, an acclaimed historian and a Pulitzer Prize uh, winner, biographer of American presidencies, uh, and somebody who has looked at the American life and history longitudinally and really gives us hope for the future, because that's where the soul of America is, in hope and generosity. 
And it's really amazing that uh, in this university where we celebrate multiculturalism, uh, we have today a Greek Orthodox president introducing soon a Catholic vice president, an Episcopalian historian, all in the presence of Father Alex and his presbyter Xanthi. Thank you for joining us. So Vice President B Biden uh, will formally introduce John Mitchell in a minute, but I do want to take a moment uh, to say a few words about our most famous alum, Joe Biden. Indeed, few institutions are fortunate enough to be able to claim as an alum a leader and public servant as distinguished as Joe Biden. When Joe first came to the University of Delaware, he was a young man who knew that he wanted to make a difference in the world. It was here where he found professors to encourage him, courses to push him, and a community to stand along, alongside him as he embarked on his life of public service and what a life it has been. For 36 years as a US senator and for another eight as vice president of the United States, he carried his University of Delaware education, experience, and values and brought them to bear in service to our nation. Joe Biden's career has always been centered on civility, respect, and the belief in the possibilities that every person carries within themselves. His record is a testament to the power of rigorous, thoughtful public policy to unleash those possibilities in our people and create meaningful change in our society. The students who will attend our Biden school are just as eager as he was to make an impact to the world. Our professors are just as dedicated to their success. They stand ready to inspire. And the challenges they'll address are as urgent as, urgent as they've ever been, from the future of our middle class to the future of our planet. It is difficult to imagine a more fitting or inspiring role model for this work than our own Joe Biden. Today, the Joseph R. Biden School of Public Policy and Administration is a reality, a bright new chapter in our university's treasured history. And by affixing Biden's name to our school and the essential work that we do in the school, we are reaffirming our commitment to integrity, to service, and to excellence. Please join me in welcoming our most distinguished alum, Vice President Joe Biden, an alum of the class of 1965. Welcome, How Father. You? How you are you? Your blessing to you. You brought the, you brought the boss. You got, you know, she, she runs the place, just like she runs your place. John, welcome. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Hello, folks. How are you? Great to see you all. And I want you. Did you, I want to introduce you to a great friend of mine, one of the great senators I serve with. I, I was told when I left the Senate to be sworn in as vice president by the Senate historian that only at the time, I think it was 13 people have ever served longer than me in the Senate, which I found so discouraging uh, <laughs> that I was that old. But uh, I've known a lot of senators, <laughs> none more decent, honorable, and committed than my buddy here, the senator from Florida. Stand up here. John. No. Thanks for coming up, John. Thanks for coming up. Well, John, welcome to my alma mater. Uh, I, uh, my sister Valerie and I went here, my wife Jill, who is teaching today um, uh, down in Virginia. She's a professor. She's on her way. She should be here before this is over. We're all, my brother, we're all University of Delaware folks. And uh, uh, I started off here, uh, and uh, my sister, as I've said before, how you doing, John? Good to see you, pal. Um, you can't take him anywhere. No, I know that. I got so many. <laughs> Even his own pol public policy school. I know that. I tell you what, but we started off, uh, Val used to be uh, 
uh, three years younger than me. Now she's 20 years younger. <laughs> and, uh, but we took basically the same courses. Uh, she graduated with honors. I graduated. <laughs> uh, and uh, we should be naming this the Valerie Biden School of Public Policy. But uh, <laughs> her daughter and husband are clapping. Uh, Dr. Asanas and uh, Maria, thank you very much. The Board of Trustees, this is a, this is a great honor. Uh, the, uh, I'm humbled and honored by uh, the renaming of this school. It goes to show you anything can happen. Uh, and, uh, but uh, the University of Delaware, uh, I have to tell you, John holds a place in my heart. I'm the first member of our family on my dad's side to go to college, and uh, it was a big deal uh, coming down here. And, uh, and I, uh, I, uh, I, used to, uh, I used to be a stutterer. By the time I got here, I had pretty much overcome it, but I remember taking uh, public speaking classes to try to uh, get better at it. Uh, and um, and I, I had professors who, uh, uh, Bill, gave me confidence. Uh, they convinced me that I could do something beyond uh, just graduate from the university. Uh, and uh, I remember uh, coming here uh, after it was strangely suggested when I was 29 years old by some senior uh, Democrats who had previously held public office. One was a former congressman, one was a former governor, suggesting that I should run for the United States Senate. And I thought they were crazy. Um, and I remember saying to the former Chief Justice uh, from a, the Tunnel family, who's had more senators in their family than any family in American history, the Tunnels. And uh, I said, but Chief, I said, he had retired by then, I said, uh, I'm not old enough. He said, obviously, he didn't do very well in constitutional law, Joe. <laughs> and I looked at him. I said, well, I won't be 30. He said, you'll be 30 by the time you'd be sworn in and you're eligible. And I remember coming to here to uh, one of my favorite professors, uh, uh, Dr. Ingersoll, and telling him a story and asking him what he thought I should do. And I'll never forget, uh, he looked at me, John, and he said, remember what Plato said? I'm thinking, what the hell did Plato <laughs> say? <laughs> and to paraphrase Plato, he said, the penalty good people pay for not being involved in politics is being governed by people worse than themselves. He said, Joe, you can do this. Go ahead and run. Were it not for the professors I had, like he and Professor Bennett and others, I would never had the confidence to think that I could do anything like this. And so I owe this university a great deal. And I hope that uh, the, uh, the Biden School is going to inspire a new generation of women and men who uh, are convinced that they can make a difference, because they can. And that's one of the purposes of this, uh, this school. And uh, today, uh, you know, Leadership requires uh, us to thoughtfully apply the lessons of history. And uh, I can think of no person, I, literally no person I'd rather have before you all today than John Meacham. John uh, um, is one of the most astute observers of American history and American political history. And he wrote a book that I highly, highly, highly recommend to all of you entitled The Soul of America. And, uh, and uh, it won the Pulitzer Prize. And uh, it, uh, it places our present political circumstances in the context of what has gone before. We've been here before in different ways, and we've always come through. But John talks about the soul of America as distinguished from the American creed, which I'm going to ask him about in a minute. And uh, um, we're living through one of those periods where uh, um, I think uh, our history can shed some light on why there's so much reason for hope and optimism now. We know America stands at a crossroads, regardless of what your politics is, whether you're Democrat, Republican, Independent. We know we're at a crossroads in terms of foreign policy, international relations, and domestic policy as well. And, uh, and, and through the threats we face today are many, in some cases, unprecedented. Um, I think uh, the choices we face today uh, are not. We're, 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 we're able to choose uh, in terms of what will become of America's soul, and I want to talk about America's soul today. And so I think this is one of the most insightful, thoughtful um, 
uh, commentaries on where we are, where we've been, and how why we can look forward to uh, to a future that is bright and uh, and significant achievement from this point on. I've often said, John has heard me say it because John was kind enough. Uh, he didn't know he was getting into when he agreed to interview <laughs> me on my book um, before a large crowd a while ago. But um, I think we're uh, we're positioned to. Uh, lead the 21st century in a way that I've never been more optimistic about. If we just get up and begin to focus on what we can do, who we are, what the possibilities are. And so, John, welcome. And before I start to ask you some questions, uh, and this is going to be wide ranging and open between us, uh, um, you want to say anything? Anything you want to? I want to, uh, Mr. Vice President, I want to go back to that Plato thing. <laughs> Does that have any resonance for you? beyond your undergraduate days? <laughs> All right, my first question. <laughs> well, we can. Uh, He's currently uh, regretting asking me to come we, to Delaware. We, <laughs> we can talk about that in a minute. <laughs> um, John. Uh, if, yes, sir. Why, why did you write the book in the first place? What, what, what prompted you to write? I mean, you've, you're a great author. You've written a number really uh, significant books, but why did you decide to write about the soul of America? Charlottesville. Uh, I'm a southerner, I'm from Tennessee, and so therefore I appreciate having my passport stamped when I came into the state, appreciate that. Um, By the way, most people, two-thirds of the people geographically in Delaware think they're southerners, so you know. That's, well, that's a good point. So I just that's want you to know you're, you're, you're right at home, y'all like, are welcome, damn we, boy. We appreciate it, we appreciate it. Uh, the first time, I, first time I met George W. Bush uh, when he was governor of Texas, uh, I, I always tell my friends in Texas that if it weren't for Tennesseans, they would still be part of Spain. You know, so and Florida would be too, Senator. And um, <laughs> you can thank me later. Um, and so we were at the governor's mansion. I said, you know, Governor, if it weren't for us, you know, you'd, you'd be a provincial governor in the Spanish Empire. And he went, <laughs> that's pretty funny, asshole. <laughs> um, <laughs> Not really a relevant story, but uh, no. um, uh, it got their attention. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I wrote it because of Charlottesville. Uh, in August of '17, uh, the uh, terrible uh, neo-Nazi Klan rally there that led to the death of a young woman, Heather Heyer, who was an anti-protester. Uh, I don't like that term. She was standing up for what America was and should be, and uh, but uh, gave her life in that cause. And I got a call from my uh, friend and editor at Time Magazine, Nancy Gibbs, who said, would you write something about historical moments that felt like this one? And so I went back to, as so much does in our history, the Civil War. Uh, what Lincoln called the fiery trial, what Shelby Foote called the crossroads of our being. The, in many ways, the Civil War, or at least the Confederate part of the Civil War, began as much at Appomattox as it ended because so many of my fellow Southerners, too many, have not given up what uh, was being fought for in the 1860s. And so there's this long shadow of, of Appomattox. And what I was struck by in climbing inside the rise of the first Klan, then the long Jim Crow period, the rise of the second Klan, as if one weren't enough, uh, in 1915, the, uh, the Bund, the pro-German folks in the 30s, Joe McCarthy. I don't know if any of this will sound familiar, but we had a freelance political operator who understood the media of the day and didn't have much of a regard for facts. <laughs> Mr. Vice who President? Who the hell could he be talking I don't know. about? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> this is, the Biden school's firing on all pistons, sir. <laughs> um, so in, in McCarthy, and then you, you, you run, into, run into the 60s. So what I wanted to do, my, my belief is that history has a particular utility, which is that it has the capacity not to make us all agree, but at least to give us a common vernacular in which we can discuss what the country's been and therefore what it can be. And I have found that arguing from history, I'm, I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a Republican, I voted for both, I plan to continue to, uh, anyway, um, <laughs> that was your cue. I'm that was your to, cue, I'm man. I'm very careful here. You are. You're, you're doing very well. I'm 0 for 3 now, but I'm trying. 
There's a, there's a pool going on what I can get you to say. <laughs> Valerie put in 20. <laughs> um, Valerie knows better than I do what I'm going to say. <laughs> I don't do anything without her telling me. But history has the capacity uh, to reach people who are on the more conservative side of where we are in our country politically and on the more liberal side because conservatives like tradition and progressives like facts. They like data. And so I think history has the, opens the aperture and brings people into a conversation that uh, is, as, is contentious. I'm not arguing that history is a bedtime story or that it's a fairy tale. There was never a once upon a time, and there's not going to be a happily ever after. And what I realized, and again, part of it's being a Southerner, I grew up on a Civil War battlefield, Missionary Ridge. It's where Arthur MacArthur won his Medal of Honor. When I was a kid, I could still find Manet balls in our yard. So history was very tactile to, to me. And it was all the day before yesterday. And to my mind, the soul of the country is not all good or all bad. But it's a, the essence of who we are. And there's a struggle between our better angels and the Klan. There's a struggle between Dr. King and our worst instincts. And I don't know about you all, but I know that if at the end of a given day, I've done the right thing 51% of the time, that's a hell of a good day. And that's true of the country as well, because a republic is only as good as the sum of its parts. And we're all very much in this. One of the uncomfortable realities, it seems to me, of, of our current moment is understanding that politicians are far more often mirrors of who we are rather than they are molders. That's an uncomfortable truth, but we have it's to true. grapple with it. Well, you know, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, you tend to find genius in with those with whom you agree. <laughs> I think he's a genius. Uh, and uh, one of the things that uh, I, uh, I had agreed when I wrote this last book that uh, with the publisher that I'd write a second book, uh, and if I wrote a second book, I'd do it with this particular publisher. And so one of the things I started to do, but it became uh, it was just too difficult a while, I'm considering what Valerie wants me to do, um, the, uh, was uh, write a book about how in periods of technological change, um, there's, it's, they tend to generate real uncertainty and openings for demagogues to be able to blame whatever the unknown is on the other. Yep. And on, uh, in the beginning of the book, there, you, you, you say extremism, racism, nativism, isolationism, driven by fear of the unknown, tend to spike periods of economic and social stress, periods like our own. You go on to say, now in the second decade of the new century, in the presidency of Donald Trump, the alienated are being mobilized afresh by changing demo uh, demography, broadening conception of identity, and an economy that prizes information, uh, age, brains over manufacturing brawn. What period is closest to this period that we're going through now? Or, or, or are, they, or, are, they, are they different? I think, it's, they? I think it's 100. If we were sitting here 100 years ago in the late winter, spring of 1919, it would be not dissimilar. We have come through the Great War. Uh, we had a president who resegregated the federal government, who cracked down on dissent. Woodrow Wilson closed 400 newspapers during the war with, just simply because he disagreed with them. Every president since then has longed for that power. Um, <laughs> The, uh, uh, you have a, an extraordinary transformation from an agrarian way of life that's not only economic but cultural, and you have the introduction of a new media, radio, which seems like I just said icebox uh, to you. But think about it. If you were an American householder in the, uh, from, the sixth, from the 17th century forward, you absolutely controlled the cultural life of your family. Nothing came into your house if you subscribe without your permission. You picked which newspapers you subscribe to, which by the way, were all partisan. That's we right. think this all got invented yesterday, but it was entirely partisan. 
you, maybe your kid would bring home a library book you hadn't known about, but that, would, that was really the one breach in the wall. And suddenly you have this radio, and there are these people in these far off places called New York and Hollywood that are programming your lives. Uh, you also have in the 1920 census, the first time the majority of Americans lived in cities and not farms, which created the rise of a celebrity culture. Walter Winchell becomes the great voice of that, where people needed national narratives, the less serious the better, to keep themselves entertained because they no longer could talk about what their neighbors down the road were doing because they didn't know most of their neighbors in the, in, the, in the large, in the scope of the cities. So what happens on the Saturday after Thanksgiving, 1915, at Stone Mountain, Georgia, the second Ku Klux Klan is founded. It rises in strength to three to five million Americans. There were 75 members of Congress who were members of the Klan. Were open, openly members yeah. of the Klan. Yeah, this wasn't like meeting late at night. I mean, this was, you were a Klansman, Hugo Black of Alabama. Um, the governors of Texas and Georgia were Klan members, which may not be surprising to you. How about this? Colorado, Indiana, and Oregon were members. The governors of those states were members of the Klan. A hundred years ago, 55 years ago, in my native state, we lived under functional apartheid. So as bad as things seem, I've never heard our friend John Lewis say things have never been worse. No. Because he was nearly killed on the streets of Alabama and Mississippi. So my argument is not things have been bad in the past, and so therefore relax, it's all going to work out. Quite the opposite. It's that without a sense of proportion, we can become overwhelmed by the problems of today. And if we realize that we've come through in this journey to make a more perfect union, storm and strife, and that that's far more the rule and not the exception, that history gives us an orienting capacity. What I found amazing, and I thought I was a student of the Klan, um, I remember uh, here at the university having a debate with one of my professors that the Klan in the 20th century is more about Catholics like me yeah. and folks from, uh, yeah. from Europe and Southern Europe than, uh, than there were about African Americans. Um, but what, what, I, what I failed to realize was that uh, in the 20s, there was a march down Pennsylvania Avenue. And there's a picture in your book, which uh, by, by the book, 50,000 people in full regalia, the pointed hats, and walking down the Pennsylvania Avenue. And uh, it not being viewed as something that was just absolutely, totally horrific. You wrote about Charlottesville. Um, Barack and I agreed we were not going to comment on the president, President Trump's administration for a year to give him a chance to get set up. He didn't expect to win. We didn't expect much from it, but we thought we'd do what W did with us, and we had great disagreement with W, not personally, but mm -hmm. his policies. But uh, when Charlottesville happened, I couldn't remain silent any longer, and I wrote a piece for it's nothing like your, as, as consequential as your book, but I wrote a piece. We're living through the battle for the soul of this nation, and it was, an, and was in uh, uh, the Atlantic magazine. And uh, the point that I was found myself having to contemplate, coming out of the civil rights movement as a kid here in Delaware, we were segregated by law mm -hmm. in the state of Delaware, um, was that, uh, and I was no great shakes, I just, you know, we desegregated movie theaters and I worked as the only Caucasian in an African-American neighborhood in the projects as a lifeguard, things like that. Um, but uh, I never thought I'd see this in my lifetime, what happened. I really didn't. I thought we had, and I, I was a history major, I think I'm a student of history, I've been doing this in public policy for a long time, and I was stunned. I was stunned that there were people coming out of, uh, out of the fields, carrying torches, singing the same, chanting the same anti-Semitic bile that was chanted in the streets of Nuremberg in 1933. I mean, the same exact language, carrying swastikas and accompanied by uh, the Ku Klux Klan and white supremacists. And then the president making a, uh, 
a, a, uh, a, a moral equivalency between those who rejected what was going on and those who were doing it and saying they're good people in both groups. Has any president since the Civil War said anything like that? No. No, well, I, by the way, no, I, because I, I, I'm, I'm not saying this to be no, I political. Know. I know, I'm, I know but, but I, and I'm not either. Uh, no. Uh, to go to your anti-Catholic point, the, one of the ways we survived the Klan uh, in the 20s was there was a restrictive seriously restrictive Immigration Act in 1924, which cut down on a, on a, on a huge amount of the, the oxygen to that, to that fight, so we can't ignore that. But the courts did the right thing. Uh, the Supreme Court in two big cases, one out of New York and one out of Oregon, ruled against the Klan. The Oregon case is particularly interesting because the, a Klan-dominated legislature in Oregon passed a law saying that every school child had to go to public school. What do you think that was about? Taking on the nuns. They were trying to shut down parochial schools, and the court threw it out. The New York case was the Klan was resisting publishing their membership and saying they were like the Kiwanis Club and they shouldn't be made to do it. But uh, because there was so much vigilante violence, the court ruled against that. That helped enormously. Joseph Pulitzer's newspapers, The New York World, did a good job. And Harding and Coolidge did the right thing. Yes. That's not a sentence you hear much. No. Uh, you know, By the way, the statements they made were yeah, pretty, pretty courageous. They the were. So full circle around, no, 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 no president had now, presidential candidates did. Um, I know he had many chapters in his life, but Strom Thurmond in 1948, not far from where that rally took place, gave a speech on a seg explicitly segregationist platform in 1948. But that can still seem kind of far away. So let's just do 50 years. The 1968 election, George Wallace <coughs> won 13.5% of the popular vote and carried five states. In the eastern shore of Delaware, in the western shore of Maryland, he was extremely popular. He was shot, but he was extremely popular and, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the southern, in the Delmarva Peninsula. His numbers were high. Fifty years ago, in the lifetime of a lot of folks here. So th these are forces that are perennial. We're not going to repeal them because you can't repeal human nature, but you can expand, it seems to me, the capacity of human nature to embrace change instead of reflexively fighting it. And again, this isn't some ideological point. If anybody here can think, and I'm quite serious about this, can think of a moment you would like to go back to in American history where we foreclosed or narrowed what Jefferson meant when he wrote what became the most important sentence in the English language, that all men were created equal. Now, I'm always careful about hyperbolic claims like that about the English language, partly because of the old story about the Texas school board candidate who said, right, was against teaching Spanish in the public schools, and on the stump said, if English was good enough for our Lord Jesus Christ, it's good enough for Texas. <laughs> so, careful about that. But, that, sorry, that aside. He can dissociate himself from this. Uh, oh, no, I. Uh, but it's the most important uh, sentence. And every period of American life that we emulate or that we commemorate, and again, find me a counterexample and raise your hand, is where we have more generously applied that promise. We have always grown stronger the more widely we've opened our arms when we've taken down walls and not built them. Well, you and I were talking about this a little bit in my office a moment ago. Um, I, uh, um, I, I spent some time with Lee Kuan Yew, uh, the former president uh, in Singapore. I was in Mumbai on my way to, uh, to, uh, to Japan, uh, to Tokyo, and then to Beijing. And I got a phone call from Lee Kuan Yew, who was referred to, uh, and Dr. Kissinger likes this, as the Henry Kissinger of the East. Uh, and, uh, but a brilliant it's funny guy. that Henry would say that. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, he wrote extensively on what he, and he was quite insightful, on the future of Russia, India, uh, the United States, and China. And uh, because I had spent so much time and, uh, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with President Xi 
And the only reason for that was he was the heir apparent to become president of Russia, I mean, excuse me, of China. And it was inappropriate for Barack to establish that relationship because he was president and he was, uh, Barack was president and he was the vice president. So it was agreed between Barack and President Hu that he and I, sh she and I should get to know one another. So we travel thousands of miles together in the United States as well as in um, China. And uh, um, I spent, I was told, more time with him than at the time than any other world leader had spent with him. And, uh, um, and so uh, Lee Kuan Yew wanted to know what I thought was going on with President, uh, the Vice President then and now President Xi. And he asked if I'd come and talk with him. And he was, uh, I think, 92 at the time. He died about uh, with, within a year after that meeting. And, uh, and it started off him asking me uh, about uh, what he was all about. What do we talk about? What was he going to do? What did I think, et cetera? And at one point during the discussion, I turned to him and I said, uh, I said, Mr. President, who was a former president, I said, what's China doing now? And he said, China is in the United States looking for the buried black box. And I looked at him, Tom, like, what do you mean, the buried black box? And he said, they're looking for the box that contains the secret that allows America to be the only country in the history of the world to be able to constantly be able to remake itself. And I said, well, Mr. President, I'm old enough to hazard a guess what he'd find in that box. I said, I think he'd find two things. One, no matter how good or bad the school is in the United States, no matter what age the child is being educated at, that there is no, we, we, we do not, uh, um, uh, tradition is important, but we have no, uh, orthodoxy is not something we worship. We, the reason we're able to make new things is we're not afraid to break old things, to do new things, unlike any other country in the world, in my view, today. And I said, there's a second thing in that box, uh, John. I said, uh, and that is an unrelenting wave of immigration. Mm -hmm. Interrupted period from the 1700s on, interrupted period by xenophobic forces that last for a couple years to a decade but they're always overcome. And he looked at me and he said, why is that important? And I said, because we've been able to cherry pick the best of every single solitary culture in the world. In order to come here, all your ancestors, it took a lot of courage. When Valerie and my great-great-great-grandfather got on a coffin ship in the Irish Sea in the middle of a famine to come here, uh, they, it wasn't like, God, this is gonna be real fun. Let's go, we know what we're gonna, what's gonna happen. The person, the, the, the family in Guadalajara right now is sitting there in a hand hewn dining room table or kitchen table saying, I've got a great idea. Dad has a great, let's sell everything, give it to a coyote. They're going to take us across the border, drop us in the desert in a place that doesn't want us. Won't that be fun? And seriously, it, the people who come and who have come are people who are optimistic, people with perseverance, people with determination, people who in fact are determined, determined to succeed. And, uh, and, and, he, and he looked and he said, I've never thought of it that way before. So going back to your point about what it is that makes up this American spirit or soul or creed or whatever you want to call it, and they're all different, you, you make a distinction among them. Um, what is it from your perspective that has allowed us to get to the point where we are now in terms of having a society that sort of signs on to the same basic overarching principles. We hold these truths self-evident. All men are created equal, endowed by their creator. We never meet that standard, but we've never rejected it before. Or I don't, we no. haven't recently rejected it. No, and, and Jefferson laid out the aspiration, and Madison and the framers gave us the means to try to make it as real as possible. And one of the most important phrases in our history comes from the preamble, that in order to form a more perfect union, it's not gonna be perfect. If you're looking for perfection, go to a university, I'm sure this one, uh, <laughs> or the church. There's nothing, institutions are valuable. We're all, we're all flawed, we're all fallen. The best we're gonna do 
is this 51% of getting it right. And I think one of the most important things that Lincoln ever said, which goes directly to your question, I think it's as important in its way as Gettysburg, was August 22nd of 1864. He's in the middle of a reelection campaign. By the way, when you're despairing about the United States, remember, a commander in chief of a nation embroiled in a civil war that killed three quarters of a million people held a full, free, and fair election and was willing to obey the result. Of all the elections to postpone, 1864 would be pretty high. But he didn't because he was fighting to defend a constitution and he said you can't defend something if you don't abide by it. But, on the, but he gave a speech, he, one of the ways he campaigned actually was the, the veterans who were returning from the front going back to the states. There's a regiment of returning Ohio troops. And he got up and he said that the war may go on for a year, it may go on for two years. He had to build up the possibility for that. And he said, but it's going on for you and your children to have what Lincoln called a fair chance for your industry, intelligence, and enterprise. A fair chance for your intelligence, industry, and enterprise. It's about the fair chance. That's the American covenant. And again, it's easy if you look like me. I'm a boringly heterosexual white Episcopalian. <laughs> All that's redundant. Uh, but, sorry. Um, I forget he might have to have an election or two. Um, uh, I think that, but if people like me, my argument is if people like me don't say this, then it's, 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 people like me are less likely to do what needs to be done to make that promise reality. And so that's why I, I, I do what I do. Um, you ask about the difference between the creed and the soul. I think that's really important. I think we can all kind of agree what an American creed is. It's a fair chance. It's if you work hard and play by the rules, you have, you have a chance to prosper. It's the, uh, James Truslow Adams was a historian in the 1930s who coined the term in American, the American dream. The phrase is only from the 1930s. And as the depression was, it's interesting, as the depression was taking root, there was this argument that, you know what, we, we endure. We, we do everything we can. We keep moving forward because we're always going to get knocked back. And that's what the more perfect union is a part, is about. Um, I think the creed is the ideal. And I actually think the soul is what we, how we can make that reality actually come to pass, that ideal come to pass. And I don't think it's right to say, and people, people can disagree with this, obviously. I don't think it's right to say that the American soul has been captured by one party or another or one element or another if you disagree with it. I think a fair-minded reading of our history and our present is that as capable as we are of great good, of projecting power around the world, and as Colin Powell used to say, only asking for the ground in which to bury our dead, right? For all that, we are capable of monstrous injustices in the past and in the present. And so the, the, we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. You can't therefore, it seems to me, logically be anti-American in a way because we're not perfect. We have to find a way to, in that battle within the soul, soul in Hebrew and in Greek means breath or life, in Genesis, when God breathes life into man, it's, it can be translated as soul. When Jesus says, uh, greater love hath no man than this, than to lay down his life for his friends, life could be translated as soul. It's who we are. It's our essence. And again, if you're being honest with yourself, and I'm being honest with myself, I know that my essence isn't all good. But I know that things are better. Things work out better for my family, for my country, when I try to heed those better angels. Well, you know, you quote uh, Augustine in the City of God yeah. and defined it as an as, as assemblies of, uh, of uh, reason beings uh, bound together by a common agreement as to the objects of their love. Isn't that a great phrase? It is a great phrase. And, uh, and so when you, when you talk about it, and 
I think it's worth taking a hard look when you read the book, and many of you have, I know already, is that um, the, what are the objects of our love? What are the common objects of our love? And I don't think it takes, John, uh, a scholar, um, uh, a particularly uh, academically well-educated individual, to be able to reason that it gets down to uh, those issues of fair play, generosity of spirit, being able to be rewarded for the work you do fairly to, uh, you know, uh, some faith in the future. Uh, and uh, that sort of is what, uh, when, uh, when, again, going back to that conversation, because it relates, it reminded me, with Xi, I was in Chengdu, and he asked me at a private dinner, just he and I, we each had an interpreter, he said, can you define America for me? And I said, yeah, I can. One word, and I meant it. And he said, what is that? I said, possibilities. I think unlike any other country in the world, we are uniquely a product and people repair to us because we believe anything is possible. That the system, the people, the circumstances provide for us to be able to realize whatever possibilities we can dream of. And, uh, and I, I don't know any other country, and I, I, I really think you, when you ask uh, whether it's uh, a, uh, a tenured PhD professor here, or you ask when you go to, to, uh, to lunch or dinner, uh, ask the, the waitress or the cook what they think about, it, and you ask them about possibilities, they, they'll look at you. But what's one of the things now that people are beginning to wonder about? Yeah. They're beginning to wonder about what, what, what are the possibilities, that the middle class is being uh, um, really battered right now. Um, the whole idea of uh, merit being rewarded. Uh, for example, I've done a lot of work with the, uh, uh, believe it or not, the last uh, two years as vice president, the business roundtable came to me and said, will you help us uh, um, change the corporate culture? And I said, is that because I'm from Delaware or is it because you think somehow <laughs> I've changed? Uh, and they said no. And uh, John Engler was a former governor of, of uh, Michigan who was the president of that. And they got brought in uh, eight CEOs, making up eight of the top 30 CEOs, largest companies in the United States. And they're worried. They're worried about uh, the fact that uh, um, corporate America is thinking too short term. Uh, where uh, the American public is losing faith in, in, in the capitalist system or the, as it exists now and, and, and in corporate culture. And uh, one of the recent examples is that, uh, you know, it used to be uh, thought at least that when things went well for corporation, the phrase I use all the time is, you know, the expectation is if you contribute to the welfare of the enterprise you work with, you get to share in the benefits. And when things go badly, you're going to get some losses. But it used to be the CEOs also took a hit when things went badly. The whole corporation right. took a hit. But, but the equation's changed now. Um, hardly any major corporation that's been in real trouble and had to make changes that are necessary, like General Motors had to in terms of eliminating four of their product lines, um, you know, no CEO took a hit, but 17,000 people lost their jobs. Uh, we bailed them out. They made $7 billion the first year out of bankruptcy. Most of them went to buy back their own stock. Um, uh, you find that now, uh, you know, we're seven new or four new lines of automobiles are going to be built, but yet 17,000 people lost their job. There are no commitment that they rebuild them in the United States of America, going to electric cars. So there doesn't there seems to be a total dis disconnect. And here's the question: Who is the uh, um, who are the stakeholders in corporate America today? Um, you write about how there is this disconnect that exists, but who, who are the stakeholders? I have a cartoon in my office uh, in Washington. It's a picture of uh, a rotund guy and it's out of the New Yorker. I guess it's five years old now. My senior staff used to keep taking it off my mantelpiece in the vice president's office because they thought it was too controversial. And they'd put it in a book and I'd take it out and put it back yeah. in the mantel. But there's a picture of this rotund guy uh, wearing a black hat, mask, a black turtleneck sweater, sitting in the end of the table, and there's a great big 
burlap bag in the table with a dollar sign on it, and he's looking at an interrogator, and he's saying, how was I supposed to know he was a job creator? <laughs> right. Well, since when did the culture change that the only people who are, are job creators are stockholders? There used to be some sense of corporate responsibility to the community. When my dad, uh, my dad sold uh, automobiles for General Motors, I think he created jobs. He managed a, you know, manufacture a, a large automobile facility right here in Newark uh, at Porter Chevrolet. I think he created jobs. I think the technicians created jobs. What is it that has happened in the day, and it's not directly mentioned in your book, but it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's uh, sort of surrounded. What is it that you think people are most upset about having lost a sense of control? I mean, what are, I'm not sure I'm asking that correctly. But no, why, why is everybody so angry? That's another way of putting it. Um, I'll vote for this man. <laughs> I think, uh, I think two things, really. One is, and you did a marvelous work on this as vice president, the whole question of the middle class and this, this, the real ethos of opportunity and how people get. And one of the creation of the post-World War II middle class in America is one of the great achievements since Rome, when you think about it. Uh, this was a generation of people who had had nothing. And they come in the 30s, and they come through the war and suddenly, by the middle of the 1950s, the, the material wealth of the United States was mind-boggling. The statistics are just extraordinary. And by the way, it was not all private enterprise. It wasn't all public either. It was a remarkable combination of defense spending and the GI Bill and public education and peop interstate highways. It was the government creating conditions for prosperity that the private sector took immense advantage of and should have. Who laid, who built the railroads? Abraham Lincoln. Who created land-grant universities? Abraham Lincoln. So the conditions for prosperity have always been a part of the public sphere. Uh, at the same time, there, we believe in what Keynes called animal spirits. We believe that Adam Smith was right, uh, most, most of us do, that in fact capitalism is the most rational response to human nature in a fallen world in the same way the Constitution is. The Constitution, in case you've set your hair on fire three times today because of Twitter, and let's be honest, you probably have, uh, the Constitution was written for moments like this. It assumed that we would be driven by appetite and ambition and that we would do the wrong thing more often than the right thing. And we have done everything we can ever since to prove the framers right. right? <laughs> Remember what Churchill said, you can always count on Americans to do the right thing once we've exhausted every other possibility. <laughs> and so I, I think people are mad because they don't see those ladders anymore. They don't see the promise. They see what you're talking about, sir. They see plutocrats and the Gilded Age and CEOs, and they don't see it for them. And then they need a reason. And sometimes on their own, and sometimes encouraged from the top, they point fingers. And they point fingers at people that don't look like them. You know, David Brooks has written a, a lot about this. I think yeah. he's a conservative columnist. I, I think he's been one of the most insightful columnists. Yeah, sure. uh, he's a Mets fan, there. but besides that, he's yeah, fine. Well, <laughs> Can't be perfect. I, I believe me, I understand. Um, one of the things that he talks about, he says, there's an invisible moral fabric that holds up our entire system. And uh, I, I, I I believe, and I want to know what your opinion is, that uh, I, I believe that virtually everything that the founders did and those who successfully followed them since then, everything in our system has been to set up guardrails to prevent or make it harder to abuse power. Mm -hmm. Whether it was the separation of government in the first instance between the executive, legislative, and judicial branches, or whether it was after World War II, NATO, so no one nation could abuse its power, 
uh, or whether it was the, uh, the European Union, so no one nation can abuse their economic power in, in, in that area. And uh, um, one of the things that, uh, well, one of the debates is that, uh, um, that what leaders say matters, even when there's such disregard for the political class, with good reason in many cases. But does it matter what, what are the most important attributes, in your view, and you write a lot about this, not, not directly, but indirectly, by referencing each of the presidents you talk about. What is the most important attribute for a president to have and those who've been most successful in unifying a nation and helping us move forward? Then, is there any one attribute that's more important than another? I do. I think it's all about temperament and vision. And the presidents who we remember fondly, so we might as well speak in the vernacular that's important to them, right? Um, if I had five minutes with the president, which is unlikely, um, I would ask him, I would propose what I call the oil portrait test, which is what do you want us to think about, sir, when we look at your oil portrait? It actually works with many politicians because they can't imagine a world where we won't be gazing adoringly at their oil portrait. So you hunt where the ducks are, right? I mean, it, it's actually pretty good. So. Think about it. Who, what I do don't we, have an oil portrait anywhere. I want you to know that. It's, it's early yet, sir. <laughs> Walked right into it. <laughs> you can't leave hanging curveballs like that, okay. sir. <laughs> Just, I know it's too easy. It's like taking candy from children, but candy tastes good. So, uh, the. The American presidents we remember, what do we remember them for in, a, in the fondest way? It's the presidents who have reached beyond their base of support. It's the presidents who have surprised us. What's the one thing people say about Nixon he went to? China. China. Ronald Reagan, who in 1980 was seen as, as he put it himself, a combination of the Mad Bomber and Ebenezer Scrooge, says the week after he's sworn in that the Soviet Union reserves unto itself the right to lie and to cheat and seeks world domination. In 1983, in front of the National Evangelical Association, he referred to as an evil empire. In 1988, he's standing next to your friend Howard Baker, then his chief of staff, in Red Square, literally playing with babies with Mikhail Gorbachev. And they say to him, Sam Donaldson yelled it, of course, said, Mr. President, is it still an evil empire? And Reagan said, that was another time. He learned. He reacted to facts. He changed his mind. Read, go read the first inaugural of Abraham Lincoln. It's not what you would engrave on the wall at the, Nash at the African American Museum. He's reassuring people in my part of the country, slavery's fine. Don't worry about it. I, you have nothing to fear from me changed his mind two years later, becomes the, the figure that Frederick Douglass said, Abraham Lincoln may have been preeminently the white man's president, but in the hurry, tumult, and confusion of the age, he saw the light and led us toward it. So, and what did, what did Lyndon Johnson do? Not a person in the world would have bet on the evening of November 22, 1963, that this Texas deal maker was going to finish the work of Lincoln. But he did. he did. And he said it that night. Yep. He's li I don't know if you did this as vice president, but he's lying in bed with all his aides around him. Did you do that a lot? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> is Dr. Biden here? Nor, nor did I sit in the bathtub like Churchill. OK. <laughs> yeah. You all know the great Churchill story about the White House, right? OK, well, quickly, if you don't know it. So he's, I, I have a, a series of, of nudity stories about world leaders. <laughs> um, it's, it's short, but you can always grab. So it's, it's, it's Christmas 1941. Uh, Churchill, if you're a writer, the vice president's writing right now, he knows when you're on a roll, you really don't want to stop. And so he dictates speeches. I actually talked to the man who was taking the dictation on this. Um, it's Christmas night, 1941. Churchill is addressing Congress the next day. And 
he's on a roll, he's dictating the speech, he gets out of the bathtub, the towel falls away, but he's still marching around dictating. And there's a knock on the door, and it's FDR, and Arthur Pridiman, his valet, pushes him in, and FDR sees the Prime Minister in all his glory and says, oh, Winston, I'm sorry, I'll come back. And Churchill says, oh no, Mr. President, as you can see, the Prime Minister of Great Britain has nothing to hide from the President <laughs> of the United States. At, later, FDR told his secretary, Grace Tully, he said, you know, Grace, he's pink and white all over. <laughs> um, you don't want to think about Reagan and Thatcher in that setting, right? You know, Bush and Blair, that's the one to it. So, where were we? Um, I got a story close to that. Oh, good. When I, first, when I first got to the Senate, I, uh, as a lot of Delawareans know, I, I didn't want to go because I just lost my wife and daughter. And, and so I, I went down, agreed to go for six months and 36 years later. But at any rate, um, and uh, one of the people that always come to my office was Ted Kennedy to see how I was doing. And he tried to get me to go down to the Senate gym. And uh, I had never met. 85% of the senators because I didn't get sworn in the same day the senators did because I stayed in the hospital with the boys and so when I got sworn in it was in the hospital by myself and so I didn't know or had not physically met at least half the senators and in the senate gym at that time it was all male and like the old YMCA they go down there and everybody walks around in their birthday suit and uh, I'll never forget walking down with Ted Kennedy and the first guy I meet is William Fulbright and, I, and he's stark naked, and all I can think is, that, Mr. Chairman, how are you? you know? <laughs> Second person I met was the chairman of what was then the Public Works Committee, Jennings Randolph, from who had a physique of, yeah. uh, of Churchill. And uh, how you doing, son? How you doing? I'm thinking, oh, God almighty, what am I doing? But that first time I met these guys, I saw, I saw all of them. Anyway, but go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> But the night of November 22nd, 1963, y'all didn't think we'd remember, did you? Um, Johnson's in his bed uh, at the Elms, uh, and Bill Moyers, Jack Valenti, the whole crew is there, and he's making a list of things to do. Kennedy's dead, the cataclysm of the assassination, and it's, it's foreign leaders you should talk to, it's what he needs to do for the funeral, it's the first letters, the first calls to the leaders, everything. And he says, I'm going to pass the Civil Rights Bill and I'm not going to change a comma. And Jack Valenti said, remember, this is 1963. This is autumn 1963. The reason Kennedy and Johnson were in Texas was because nobody knew Barry Goldwater was only going to win five or six states. They were worried. Texas had just lost. Johnson's seat went to a Republican, which hadn't happened since Reconstruction. John Tower. John Tower. So there was a split in the Democratic Party in Texas. Ralph Yarborough, the great progressive, the great populist, and John Conley, the great uh, conservative. And the Democratic Party in Texas was worried because there was a bright young guy who was in, in the offshore business in Houston who was going to run on the Republican ticket named George Herbert Walker Bush. And Lyndon Johnson had this vision of two Republican senators from Texas, and that just was, was not going to work. So one of the reasons they were there was to try to keep the conservative Democratic coalition together. So cut to that night. Johnson says, I'm going to pass this. Valenti says, Mr. President, why don't we wait till this time next year? And Johnson says, no, what the hell is the presidency for if not to do the things that other people might not? That's what presidents are great. great that's what makes a great president. It's interesting uh, that uh, you write about uh, continuation of that notion that uh, uh, Johnson's determination that he was going to do this, and uh, and uh, he was uh, getting in a little bit of a fight with McCormick, and who was then a leader and others, and and he said, I speak tonight, this is on March 13th, 1965, I said, I speak tonight for the dignity of a man and the destiny of democracy. I urge every member of both parties, Americans of all religions, all colors, from every sector of the country to join me in a cause. At times, history and fate meet at a single time and a single place to shape the turning point in man's unending search for freedom. And he goes on talking about Lexington and Concord, but he ends this five paragraphs. Says, on the issue of equal rights for Americans, Negroes, uh, American Negroes is such an issue. And should we defeat 
every enemy? Should we double our wealth and conquer the stars? And shall we and, sh and still be unequal on this issue? Then we will have failed as a people and as a nation. For with a country as with a person, what is a man profit if he gains, if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? And that was Lyndon Johnson. One of the interesting things was I got a, an award from the Johnson Library. And uh, of all people, one of the reasons why, you know, guys like me ended up running in 1972 was about the war in Vietnam, when even the war in Vietnam was not Johnson's thing. Johnson remember bringing up uh, McGeorge Bundy and saying, how do we end this war? And his response was, we don't know how, to, how do we win this war? He said, we don't know how to win it. We know how to not to lose it. Right. I bought that book and gave it to 20 members of the administration yeah. when we were talking about Afghanistan. Yeah. And so it's amazing how people transform. That was how the McMaster they, book, right? Yes, yeah. it was McMaster's book, exactly right. And so my point is that, that it is, it, it, it goes to what the role of the president is. And the, and you, you, you know, you've forgotten more about this than I know, but it's the complexity of these people. My friend Doris Kearns Goodwin likes to say, if you're ever going to put Johnson on Rushmore, it'd be half a face. Yeah. That's, uh, Not bad, right? Yeah. And that's more than most of us. <laughs> President company excluded, I guess. But uh, it's kind of, but I think that's, and also the other piece I would recommend, uh, if you really want to dork out, and let's be honest, you're here, so you probably are likely to do that, uh, is to read uh, Frederick Douglass in 1876 wrote an amazing, yeah. de delivered an amazing oration, a meditation on Lincoln. It was the dedication of the Freedmen's Monument down in Washington. And if you want to, to me, if you want to understand both the complexity, ambiguity of American history and the complexities and ambiguity of biography, and as Emerson said, there's properly no history, only biography. Douglas on Lincoln, who basically says he didn't want to help us necessarily, but he did. And it would have been easier in some ways for him not to do it. And it's this wrestling with the, the, the twilight struggle we're, we're all in that, and I, I said this before, but I just, we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Well, you know, one of the things that the reason I found your book so insightful is just as a witness to history, being in the place I've occupied for over 40 years of my life, um, I have watched uh, um, individual senators and presidents grow and change, and some digress some, uh, and how they face uh, um, face real challenges uh, that go to the heart of the soul of America. Um, and, uh, but most of them have stepped up. Most of them in the really critical moments have not uh, walked away from uh, what I think most of us would agree is the soul of America, the, the you know, the, 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 the sort of decent response. And, uh, um, I, I, I found that, uh, you know, I, I'm often criticized because I, uh, I have a, a lot of folks I've worked with, Republicans that are my close friends. I don't find, uh, you know, one, one of the things like with John McCain. John McCain and I went after each other hammer and tong. I mean, he would go after me and I shouldn't be in the ticket and all these. But John and I had the same value set that brought us to a different place a different conclusion as how to deal with specific issues. And I find that most of the women and men that I've respected the most are people that do understand, however you want to define it, and it's very slightly, uh, the soul of America. Mm -hmm. they, have a, they have a value set that they think, uh, and, when, and when pressed, they, they, they yield to that soul rather than their self-interest. Not everybody. Not everybody. And you only, and, and tell me if you think this is right, you really only have to get it right once. Yep. No, I think that's true. Right. And I think when they get it right once, I think that they realize that, uh, here, let me ask you this. My 
sister has always heard me say that I think that um, uh, that the American public rewards elected officials, even when they disagree with them, if they believe they're authentic mm -hmm. and they believe they are expressing what they truly feel to be the right course, even when they disagree with a specific proposal made to deal with a specific issue, a specific problem. The time that I've observed that, 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 you, uh, that you are punished as a public official is if you turn out to be something different than you advertised yourself to be. Yes. What, what's your Church, sense? Uh, Churchill had a great insight about this. He, uh, in the middle of the winter of 42, he faced a vote of confidence in the House and had to give a 10,000 word speech about the conduct of the war. And in his memoir, he later talked about you know, he had to be, can he had to be, he had to level with people. And the, the passage in the memoir says that the British people or the American people can face any misfortune with fortitude and buoyancy as long as they are convinced that those who are in charge of their affairs are not deceiving them or are not themselves dwelling in a fool's paradise. It's a two-pronged test. We basically want to know, are you lying to us or are you lying to yourself? And if you pass those two, and we believe that you're actually leveling with us, then we, we tend to do what it takes. That's, in many ways, the covenant of modern democracies. I think you're exactly right. I think people uh, have an innate sense that ultimately the truth will out and that character matters enormously. And I don't necessarily mean entirely personal character, but, but Heraclitus is, is, one of the, is one of the oldest insights in the, in the, in the canon. It said that character is destiny. And in, in Greek, the word can also translate as fate. Character is fate. And let me ask you, I mean, you've, you've, you've been a heartbeat away. Uh, is that true? Yeah, I think it is. I, I, I really think one of the reasons why I had uh, confidence in, as you probably know, I, I know you know, that when I was asked to be vice president, I didn't want to do that. I, uh, Your mother took care of that. Yeah, she did. <laughs> My mother did take care of it. <laughs> Joey first African-American to be president, you think he's qualified, and he says he needs you to win Pennsylvania. You told him no, honey. Um, <laughs> remember that, Val? <laughs> and the rest is and history. And the rest is history. But, but the thing about uh, um, that, you really get the measure of a woman or a man when you see them under enormous pressure. Um, and uh, um, one of the things about what happened with Barack, with President Obama, most of the crises he faced were crises of first instance. Mm. We'd never had a recession that was a fiscal recession like this. It was, we'd never been there before. It's not like we could go back and look at history and see how it was handled. We, we were never in a situation before where the single greatest concern of the American people were stateless actors who were about to uh, you know, do great harm and damage to the United States of America. We, and there's a whole range of things. I used to say to him, Mr. President, everything's landed on your desk but locust. <laughs> um, and, uh, but one of the things that uh, you talk about character, I, I think character is destiny. And uh, I, I watched, I, I knew the president, not intimately, before he was elected. But I came to know him intimately, and we became close friends. I mean, it's a genuine personal friendship. And uh, all those memes are true, uh, <laughs> except that uh, he, he did the first friendship bracelet, not me. Uh, but, <laughs> but all kidding aside, um, one of the things people will ask me about whether or not, I mean, how did that relationship develop? It's like any other relationship. It's like a friendship or a marriage. It grows out of trust. and. Uh, what I watched him do is I watched him deal. The deal we had was he asked me what I wanted as, well, did I have any conditions? I had no condition. He said, well, let's talk about when I decided to do it, uh, how we want to do this. 
and we agreed with Mondale's recommendation that we should have a private lunch once a week, which we did, mm -hmm. where we could literally holler at one another, disagree like brothers, and know that wouldn't go beyond that room. I knew I could tell him things that I wouldn't even tell him in front of senior staff where I disagreed with policy. And he would give me hell too. Um, uh, and, uh, but one of the things that I observed about him was that uh, he owned up to whatever shortcoming he had and he was unwilling to try to um, paper over any shortcomings that we had uh, that had uh, were a consequence of any policy. And so I found him to be somebody who was, who had real character. Um, and it was easy, it was easy to, uh, to serve him that way. I mean, I get credit for always having his back. Well, that's the job of a vice president. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't hard because even when I may have disagreed, which wasn't very often, it was usually on, 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 on tactic, not on substance, um, I, I just knew who this man was at his core. And uh, one of the things that I'm proudest of in serving with him is that we went for eight years and not a, not a whisper of scandal, not a whisper of anything that was, uh, because, because I trusted him. Mm -hmm. I trusted him. And the flip of that is that he trusted me enough and it took great personal confidence to do this. It's hard for a president to delegate. Mm a major responsibility to someone else without being criticized for it. But he was confident enough in his capacity and his abilities to delegate things to me where he gave me presidential power. I could hire, fire, and, and so it, it, it worked. But I, 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 I credit it to character. This guy has a backbone like a ramrod. He right. was uh, honest as hell. We all have our shortcomings. He used to say to his close friends, what's it like with Joe? He said, it's like having a big brother. We make up for each other's shortcomings. Well, he made up for most of all mine. I made up for maybe one or two of his. But all kidding aside, it, it was based on trust. Uh -huh. and, and the trust was a consequence of having confidence in the character, the decency, the honor, the commitment of the person you were dealing with. Uh -huh. But it's no different than any personal relationship, I think. But it, it's turned out to be something that made it worthwhile. Um, uh, can I ask you one more question? Because I don't know what my time is here, because uh, someone's me, supposed to tell I'm me. Gonna, I'm, can I jump in? Oh, yeah, that? you can do, sure. Um, I, don't, I, I would be remiss in not asking this. Uh, there are a number of people in this room and around the country who would very much like to see your character back in the arena. So what are you confident, what are you able to tell us at this point about your thinking? <laughs> I thought it was very polite. So, uh, <laughs> look, uh, most of these people are Delawareans. I, uh, I owe them so much. Um, they, uh, um, and I mean this sincerely, they've been with me in good times and bad. They've, uh, they've been there to hold me up, lift me up. and. They've been there to tell me when they think I'm dead wrong, which I've been more than once. And, and, but they've, uh, they've been straightforward and honest with me. It's one of the great advantages of representing a state this small. Um, and uh, um, Okay. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll just tell you straight up. We, we've had, uh, we've been having I know the people of Delaware will not be surprised by this, but others might. We do everything by family meetings um, because no man or woman has a right to run for high public office without it being a family decision. And uh, from uh, being pushed, pushed, prodded by my son Hunter and my wife Jill and my daughter, um, there is a, we just had a family meeting with all the grandkids too. and. Uh, um, and there's a consensus that I should, they want, they, the most important people in my life, want me to run knowing, and by the way, they're, they're, they're not naive. From the time they were born, including my children, 
they have been in the public eye. It's not a bad place, but not an overwhelmingly comfortable place to be. Everything that happens is public knowledge. Um, you, uh, you get to celebrate publicly and you have to share your grief publicly. And, um, and so they're, they're not naive. Um, and my granddaughters and grandson are not naive either. And so um, the first hurdle for me was deciding whether or not um, I am comfortable um, taking the family through what would be a very, very, very difficult campaign. No matter who runs, it's a very difficult campaign. The primary will be very difficult. And the general election running against the President Trump, I don't think that he's likely to stop at anything um, and whomever he runs against. And so I am, I'm, 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 I'm certain about where the family is. Um, but the second piece is that I don't want this to be a fool's errand. Um, and uh, I want to make sure that if we do this, and we're, we're, we're very close to getting to a decision, that I am fully prepared to do it. And by that I mean uh, we want to make sure, that for, for example, from the last time Barack and I ran, and that was a presidential campaign, I wasn't a presidential candidate, but I know about presidential campaigns, um, that between then and now, um, the whole issue of uh, social media and the use of social media and has fundamentally changed. Um, and uh, so we've been getting briefings from the most advanced people in the country who run these major platforms and telling us what we'd need, what kind of organizational structure we'd have, and it's, it's a massive, massive undertaking. Um, we also are making a decision whether or not we can fund this campaign on my conditions because I will not accept, uh, I will not be part of a super PAC or accept, I mean, I, I've already, well, and to see whether or not it's realistic. An awful lot of people have offered to help and the people who are usually the biggest donors in the Democratic Party, and I might add some major Republican uh, folks. Um, and then the other thing is making sure we put together a campaign organization reflects who we are as a country, made up of women and men and African Americans, Hispanic, Latinos, uh, uh, Asian. I mean, it's, it's to reflect who I am and finding out who's available to people this campaign. And we're also uh, taking a hard look at um, uh, whether or not it is uh, um, this alleged appeal that I have, how deep does it run? Is it real? Um, no, I'm, no, I'm being very, I'm being completely honest with you because I can, uh, John, that's a fair question, I, I, I can die a happy man never having lived in the White House, but what I don't want to do is I don't want to take people's time, effort, and, uh, and, 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 and commitment without there being a clear shot that I could be the nominee. I think we can. I think that's where we are, but there's still a couple um, hurdles to go through to make sure we have all this in place. And, uh, and if we conclude that, I would announce and I'd run for president. And, uh, but, you know, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I, but, 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 but I'm not there yet. I, 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 I don't want to mislead you. I'm being more straightforward. Yeah. Look, no one's ever doubted I mean what I say. The problem is I sometimes say all that I mean. <laughs> and, uh, and so this has to be, we're, we're in the final stages of that decision. And, uh, but uh, it would be the, you know, the greatest honor of my life to, uh, to be president of the United States. But also it is a, uh, it's something that I have to, uh, um, make sure that I could run a first-rate effort to do this and, um, and make clear where I think the country should go and how to get there. And that's the process going on right now. But that's as straightforward as I can be. I have not made the final decision, but don't be surprised. What is it? You're tough. <laughs> you know, they're telling me that time is up, but one of the, th 
His timing is impeccable. <laughs> you know, when, when John inter interviewed me, which was wonderful of him to do uh, on my book tour, uh, I said, you know, basically, we said, please don't ask about this, uh, because we were much further away from it uh, than we are now. And he didn't, but he saved it for the end. <laughs> um, <laughs> folks, John's going to stick around and sign books. Uh, if you are interested, they're going to move these chairs and bring up a table. Um, and, uh, and I really mean this, and I sincerely mean it. I think that uh, I don't know any serious public official in either party who hasn't taken a look at and looks to and takes seriously what John has to say about the state of the nation and what the possibilities are. And um, let me conclude by saying I really believe, and I think you do, John, but I, you speak for yourself, obviously. I think America is better positioned to lead the 21st century than any time in American history. I think we have it all. I think we have all the capacity that is needed. I think we have the people. I think we have the greatest research universities in the world. We're in a position where the wealthiest, most powerful nation in the world, but we lead, and this is what worries me. We've always led not by the example of our power, but by the power of our example. The power of our example. And the world, I can tell you from traveling around the world and recently being in Munich with other heads of state, I, 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 they're, they're desperately yearning to find out we haven't, we haven't lost our soul. Mm -hmm. We are who we are. And I'm not, and by the way, there are Republicans who are concerned about this and Republican people running for public office. I went into 68 races in this off year to campaign for senators, governors, Democratic candidates for the House. And you know what I found no matter where I was? What the American people are looking for in the Democratic Party as well as the Republican Party is people of character. They're looking for people who they think have character. So we got a lot of it here. Did you want to make any closing comment? No, I just an honor to be here. And uh, I couldn't do what I do, and we couldn't live in the country that we want to live in without men and women of enormous character and good temperament making the sacrifices necessary to be in the arena and fight our battles. And the Vice President has been an exemplar of that and I suspect will continue to be. Oh, that's nice thank you. you. Say. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. Are we uh, we're going this way? Thank you. Mr. President, thank you. Thank Am I going to see you? Help. Thanks, John. If you haven't read the book, get it and read it. And every time we'd walk out of my grandfather Finnegan's house, he'd yell, Joey, keep the faith. And my grandmother yelled, no, Joey, spread it. Go spread the faith. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, sir. John. You're very generous.